Good morning. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just, I think Dr. Devin want me to remind you that the survey that he's uh, sent email to us, both faculty and residents are there. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Michael B. Nickel. Uh, Dr. Nickel is a, a brand new faculty member and staff member at the VA hospital and uh, a, uh, 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 comes to us as a uh, surgical oncologist. He's going to talk about the role of IL-35 in pancreatic cancer. Dr. Nickel. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Stewart, for the opportunity to present. This is uh, work that I conducted at the, while I was on faculty at the University of Missouri, where I ran a very small research lab. <clears throat> but I think it's interesting work. Uh, I have no disclosures. So pancreas cancer is a, is a bad deal. Uh, it's slowly creeping up as the uh, co com most common cause of death. Uh, it looks like it might soon catch uh, breast cancer, and the reason is because it has a high lethality. You know, the overall survival rate at five years is around five, six percent, and most patients present with locally advanced disease, making them not candidates for resection. And only a, a small handful of patients who present with pancreatic cancer will have, uh, will be able to uh, undergo surgery. And I uh, just want to make a mention here, we're talking about adenocarcinoma, not any other types of pancreas cancer because the picture in those is much, much different. So with surgery, this is our objective, is a good tumor clearance, meaning negative margins and gathering all the lymph nodes. And this <clears throat> picture is really what we want to see at the end of, uh, at the, end of the resection after the specimen has been delivered. You want to see a nice clean portal vein, the uh, SMA is hiding somewhere back behind here and a, a good lymph node dissection. So w what are the hurdles in pancreas cancer care? Well, <clears throat> one, it's difficult to diagnose early. We don't catch it very early. And only about 7% of patients have disease that hasn't metastasized or spread locally. Uh, scans and biopsies are not particularly good for or they can be inaccurate, and scans are not particularly good for screening, and we don't have any really good biomarkers at this time to screen for pancreas cancer. As I mentioned earlier, uh, only a few patients are candidates for primary therapy, if you consider surgery as primary therapy. Uh, we'll talk in just a minute about neoadjuvant therapy and vascular resection, how that may increase the number of patients uh, who can undergo resection. Primary treatment or surgery is, a, is pretty harsh, and I'm going to present some uh, data to you as to the actual effectiveness of surgery. Uh, and surgical complications are common. And even the adjuvant therapies which have been developed and used in the last uh, few decades have only provided marginal survival improvements. So some of the things we may address here is can early detection uh, be improved? And the answer is no. We really need better biomarkers. Um, and, and this is an ongoing area of act, uh, research in many labs. Well, can more candidates become, or more patients become candidates for resection? Really, this becomes a question of, for the surgeons, at this point, can vessel involvement be overcome to include more uh, patients for resection? Because those with metastatic disease are obviously not candidates for resection. Well, two uh, treatment paradigms have arisen in the last, 15, 20 years uh, to, to increase the number of patients who are resection candidates, and they're often used in combination. One of these is neoadjuvant chemotherapy or neoadjuvant chemoradiation. This is a really good example of uh, before treatment, large tumor in the head of the pancreas with involvement of the uh, SMV and, and probably the artery as well. And you can see that the tumor has shrunk considerably uh, after treatment. Now, unfortunately, this doesn't happen very common with uh, new adjuvant therapy. You can really only expect this kind of result rarely. The other is in the hands of the surgeon, and this is uh, vascular resections. Most of these are vein resections and repairs. Uh, there are some 
centers which do arterial resections, but I would say this is, that's a very, very specialized uh, area of, uh, of this uh, surgery. And again, not done very often because not a lot of candidates are, uh, or not a lot of patients are candidates. <clears throat> but anyway, this uh, image demonstrates how you can again achieve clearance along the vessels and there are a number of ways to reconstruct the, the veins, but we're not going to talk about surgical technique today. <clears throat> Despite achieving a good operation, you're still going to have not very good outcomes. This is data derived from uh, John Cameron's publication of his first thousand Whipples a few years ago. And these are patients with adenocarcinoma who underwent uh, the Whipple procedure. And the five-year survival for this group is 18%. And that mirrors just about what everybody else publishes somewhere between 15 and 20 percent after uh, resection. So again, not, not very good. <clears throat> and in that five-year uh, survival group, the, there are a number of patients who will recur. And actually, five-year survival is not considered cure in uh, pancreas cancer. Uh, recently, there are some publications looking at 10-year survival, which gives a, a number more like 5 or 10%. And Dr. Warshaw in, in Boston has warned us even 10-year survivalists may not truly be cured of their pancreas cancer. So what is the, oh, I'm sorry, let me, uh, let me just run a quick uh, numbers for you here in Bear County. What can we expect on an annual basis? Well, the population here is about 1.8 million, and the pancreas cancer incidence specific to Bear County is 11.5 per 100,000. So that's about, <clears throat> oh, sorry, that's about 270 pancreas cases, pancreas cancer cases per year. I mean, that checks pretty well with what's uh, the last number, which was published in 2007, which was 163. 15% of these 207 can undergo resections. That's 31 resections per year. <clears throat> and if we estimate five-year survival in the resected cases at 15%, that's about four or five patients a year, we'll make it to five years. And then if we look at 10 years, we're probably talking one to three patients per year who develop pancreas cancer here in San Antonio, we'll make it to 10, 10 years. That's, that's pretty dismal. <laughs> Sometimes you have to ask yourself when you're a pancreas surgeon, why am I doing this? I think this is a, a good an analogy for the current state of pancreas cancer treatment. Now, Dr. Perry was here, or Dr. Savu, they might be thinking at this time, you know, who did I hire as my pancreas surgeon? This guy doesn't sound like he wants to operate. Well, there are other benefits to resection. Certainly, uh, it seems like you, there is a small amount of prolonged survival for patients who undergo resection for uh, pancreas cancer, and many of them will have good quality of life in this time. As we've been mentioning, there's a rare opportunity for cure. It can certainly palliate pain. <clears throat> it can uh, prevent or relieve biliary and enter enteric obstruction and keep these patients out of the hospital and also avoid uh, need for repeated endoscopic or percutaneous interventions on the enteric or biliary system. Um, I haven't seen any analyses for cost savings, but I would think that there may be some uh, potential cost savings there. And ultimately, we want to make the death process for most of these patients who are going to die from pancreas cancer as tolerable as we can. And that's a, an important part of surgical oncology. So it seems like maybe the hurdles aren't the ones that we, we mentioned earlier, uh, surgical technique and good clearance locally, that maybe we need to rethink uh, how we're approaching uh, pancreas cancer. And this is a famous quote from uh, Dr. Katie, and I think really summarizes uh, the, uh, the, what, the battle that we're in. And really, biology is what seems to dictate our successes. <clears throat> and so we have to ask, well, what's the biology of pancreas cancer? How do these pancreatic cancer patients die? And we've already said uh, median overall survival is uh, poor, even with the, the best treatment available. Uh, but the majority of recurrences are uh, systemic. They're either in the liver, uh, the peritoneum, or extraperitoneal sites. And this is what causes death for most patients with pancreas cancer. 
So good tumor clearance probably doesn't achieve much for patients with, uh, and local therapy doesn't achieve much for patients with systemic diseases, is really what it boils down to. And so pancreas cancer is a systemic disease. There's good preclinical evidence that suggests that it metastasizes very early <clears throat> and it's resistant to the currently available systemic regimens. So these are the real hurdles uh, to improving survival. And we really need new or additional strategies for systemic therapy. <clears throat> and, uh, yeah. and again, I'm not saying surgery is off the table here. Uh, but, it, you know, if we had better systemic therapy, we have better outcomes with our surgery. Maybe even have more patients who can, uh, who can come to surgery. I'm going to switch gears here a little bit. And I trained at the John Wayne Cancer Institute where uh, Dr. Morton was the head for uh, just until last year when he died. And Dr. Morton, if you don't know, is famous, of course, for pioneering the sentinel lymph node biopsy, which was an overwhelming success. We use it in melanoma and breast cancer, and it's being explored in other cancers. Uh, but what he's also famous for is his, his failure, which was Canvaxin, or his pancreas cancer vaccine. And uh, <clears throat> although he was able to show systemic responses in patients, he never was able to achieve a survival advantage um, with his, uh, with his uh, treatment. And so, those of us who worked in immunotherapy have heard this from other researchers. Uh, and immunotherapy is and will always be the future of oncology care, saying uh, we really haven't gotten anywhere. But actually, this has just recently changed uh, with the introduction of the anti-CTLA-4 antibodies and the, uh, um, the anti-PD-1 treatments for uh, melanoma, which is now expanding rapidly into other cancers. And in fact, science. Uh, declared cancer immunotherapy the, the number one breakthrough in the year of 2013. So I, I, I take a <laughs> personal pleasure in that after hearing for many years that immunotherapy would never work. So immunotherapy has uh, had great successes now in melanoma and prostate cancer and hematogenous malignancies. Uh, in pancreas cancer, it's, it's way behind. Uh, and really trails um, other tumors significantly. There are uh, very, very few human trials, uh, certainly in comparison to other tumor types. And the strategies have mirrored the strategies which have failed in the past in other, other tumors. Uh, cancer antigen vaccines of various types, peptide-based or cellular-based. <clears throat> uh, one that, that does show some promise is, uh, is developed by New Link. Uh, and it's a very interesting um, approach where they've reprogrammed cancer cells with uh, an embryonic antigen, which most people respond to. And so it's the tumor itself is its own uh, adjuvant for uh, chemotherapy. They've also been very smart in their strategy in that they um, have uh, conducted their trials in patients who've undergone resection so the, the patients who have maybe small tumor burden, small tumor load, where many of these are used in stage four patients with uh, large tumor burden. So hard, hard to be successful. Uh, adoptive T cell, T cell transfer has been uh, conducted, and there are uh, various dendritic cell um, approaches as well. I'll be interested to see, I, I'm sure, if it hasn't already happened, it will happen soon, that anti-CTLA-4 and PD-1 will be tried in pancreas cancer. It's seems to be spilling over to every tumor type. It'll be interesting to see if, those, uh, if there are any responses. My interest in immunotherapy is, is focused on why does immunotherapy fail, and there's a, a lot of subjects uh, to study because there's been a lot of failure in immunotherapy. Uh, in particular, I've been interested in uh, CD4 cells, <clears throat> and uh, CD4 cells really run the, the immune response to cancer, if you will, and uh, you can see there's at least four different lines of differentiation described at this time, um, corresponding to these different uh, ultimate um, effectors, and the, the uh, T regulatory, or the regulatory T cell population you know, are those that you know, have an inhibitory response and are interest of the, uh, to those who do this sort of cancer work. 
And I'm sorry, that didn't show up so well. This is uh, data I published years ago in um, uh, looking at the elimination of regulatory T cells in a cancer model sarcoma model. And we found a uh, much better response to uh, tumor antigen after the, the CD4 cells, C, um, after the regulatory cells were, were removed. And we also saw um, animals that rejected their tumors. Now, lots of other people have done these same sorts of studies with regulatory T cells, but there's not much uh, that's been done in, in clinical trials that I'm aware of. I'm going to switch gears here just for a, a little second. The uh, IL-12 cytokine family is uh, important to our talk today. And this includes uh, IL-12, 23, 27, and 35. And you can almost think of each of these as responsible for the drivers of uh, the various T cell differentiation uh, that I just showed you. Now, each is a heterodimer, and they share alpha and beta, beta chains uh, for the um, cytokine itself as well as for the receptor. <clears throat> and as I mentioned, they uh, regulate the pro and anti-inflammatory immune response. And each of these is unique. Um, they don't really overlap much, but they do complement one another. IL-12 drives the TH1 response. <clears throat> IL-23 drives IL-17, uh, uh, the TH17 response. Uh, IL-27 is uh, anti-inflammatory, the other side of the, the picture, as well as IL-35. Now, IL-35 is a little bit different than the others in that these, most of these cytokines are made by dendritic cells or antigen-presenting cells, whereas IL-35 is actually made by regulatory T cells. And it's uh, the newest member of the, the family. And IL-35 in regulatory T cells action, uh, functions as an autocrine growth factor. So it enhances proliferation of these cells and induces further secretion of IL-35 by the regulatory T cells. And it's recently been proposed as the effector molecule for Treg function. Anybody familiar with regulatory T cells knows that for years and years we've never known exactly how they work. We know TGF beta is involved, IL-10 is involved, but those don't seem to be the effector molecule in the system, uh, it may actually be the IL-35. And, and the end result is it inhibits CD8 uh, T cell function. And IL-35 dysregulation uh, contributes to the development of infectious and autoimmune diseases. And this is what most of the work in IL-35 is centered on. Uh, and then lastly, these uh, IL-35 secreting Tregs may actually be a subset of Tregs, that's the inducible subset as opposed to those which do the uh, housekeeper functions. So <clears throat> interesting, powerful molecule. And then more on uh, the structure of IL-35, which is pertinent to some of the slides I'm going to show you, or the receptor uh, structure. Uh, and it, it signals through a JAK-STAT pathway. So what do we know about IL-35 in cancer? Well, actually not that much. It's pretty new, and not a lot of people have studied it. Uh, an interesting study came out uh, a year ago where a Chinese group sampled 30 or 50 different cell lines, cancer cell lines, for expression of IL-35. And the ma vast majority of them, I think about 75%, expressed IL-35. Uh, so it's very present in, um, in cancer cell lines. <clears throat> in the... Um, in patients, we see elevated serum IL-35 in colorectal cancer and in pancreas cancer. And interesting, in, in colorectal cancer, after resection of the primary tumor, IL-35 levels drop. And then lastly, I mentioned uh, a mathematical model, which I honestly don't understand, but it suggests uh, a role for IL-35 in tumor growth. And actually use my data as their validation data set. So what is the role for IL-35 in pancreas cancer? That's a question we asked. And uh, what we expected to find was uh, regulatory T cells expressing IL-35 in, in pancreas cancer. And so we assayed six paraffin-embedded human pancreas cancer samples. Mind you, I ran a small lab, and so we had to do things on a small scale. And then we worked with uh, very common pancreas cancer cell lines for in vitro assays. 
Uh, and then we use various modes of uh, immunohistochemistry and uh, dual fluorescence imaging uh, for detection of uh, um, IL-35 and its receptor. And then we use fairly standard uh, assays for proliferation, apoptosis. So these are the results, um, four representative sections, IHC of staining human pancreas cancer uh, for IL-35. And actually, all six of our samples expressed IL-35 uh, pretty strongly. So we, we knew it was there. Uh, and then we looked to see which cells were actually expressing it. And that's what the panel B shows you. Um, PCK is pancytokeratin, so it stains the epithelial cells, the cancer cells, and not the uh, immune cells. IL-35, of course, is the cytokine of interest. Uh, GP-130 and IL-12 uh, receptor beta-2 are the subunits for the IL-35 receptor. <clears throat> there was, at the time of the study, no antibody specific for IL-35 receptor, so we had to do those separately. Anyway, you can see on the merged images that in our representative section here, uh, it's, the, it's the pancreas cancer itself that's expressing IL-35, as well as the receptor. Then we tested this in our cell lines to see if we'd actually be able to work with, uh, work with the cell lines. And again, you can see expression uh, pretty uniformly of our uh, cytokine, as well as a receptor, both on IHC and by uh, dual fluorescence uh, microscopy. So then we look for actual function of IL-35 uh, in these cells. And we gave uh, escalating doses of IL-35 into the supernatant. You can see the increase in the colony counts. So uh, uh, the IL-35 promotes uh, growth in these, uh, and proliferation in these cancer cells. And that's what the panel B shows us, the PCNA staining. Uh, and uh, the bottom panel, panel three, um, or I'm sorry, panel E, shows you our blocking experiments where we used an antibody against IL-35 to show that there was a, a decrease in uh, proliferation after IL-35 was eliminated for, or blocked in the cultures. So I think um, pretty good evidence for IL-35 uh, as uh, a cytokine which promotes proliferation in these pancreas cancer cell lines. Our lab is very interested in molecular mechanisms as well. Uh, so we have a panel we developed looking at the various uh, molecules involved in uh, proliferation. Uh, that panel is actually about twice as large as this, but uh, this shows you just the uh, important findings here. Uh, and so treatment with IL-35 in our cell lines was associated with increases in cyclin B, cyclin D, CDK2 and 4, and, and P27. So I'm giving some hint as to what's going on there. Then we looked at the uh, opposite end of the equation, apoptosis, uh, because apoptosis and proliferation, while interrelated, are not the same uh, mechanism. And again, we found... Uh, um, exposure of our cell lines to IL-35 significantly increased uh, or significantly decreased the rate of apoptosis. And th this was confirmed with tunnel staining and uh, caspase-3 activity assay. So again, we looked at our molecular panel for apoptosis and we found an increase in BCL-2 and decrease in trail receptor 1. Uh, kind of fairly common sort of findings. Uh, and this is uh, immunohistochemistry. Uh, sorry, that's not so good. Uh, it didn't come up so well there. Immunohistochemistry to confirm our, um, our findings by real-time PCR. Sorry about that. Uh, so with that data set, we, we uh, drew the conclusion that IL-35 is produced by human pancreas cancer cell lines and that in this system promotes proliferation and decreases apoptosis and seems to work as an autocrine growth factor for at least pancreas cancer cell lines. And I think we give a little bit of evidence for its presence and the presence of its receptor in pancreas cancer samples. This is some unpublished data uh, where we looked just with IHC and, again, dual um, 
uh, dual fluorescence immunostaining. At the presence of IL-35 in different types of pancreas tumors and, and in normal pancreas, and we're somewhat limited by our ability to acquire specimens. You've seen normal pancreas in this small data set didn't express IL-35 at all. IPMN had a low expression rate, solid pseudopapillary tumor, which some people consider malignancy. Most people probably consider malignancy, but not everybody. Had no expression, but only two samples, hard to interpret. And this is a, a separate uh, set of six adenocarcinomas, and five of those six expressed uh, IL-35. So in total, we have 11 of 12 adenocarcinomas expressing IL-35. So I think the data is starting to, to add up. <clears throat> so this is just uh, starter stuff here. And uh, what I'd like to do is confirm this in, in vitro, or I'm sorry, in vivo, uh, in, a, in a mouse model. Um, and then I'd also like to look at the effects of IL-35 uh, in conjunction with chemotherapy, uh, you know, 5-FU and gemcitabine, the standard chemos, to see what the, what the effect is. Um, and I think we should probably look at signaling pathways. And then based on the last data I showed you, I think it'd be really nice to to uh, set up a study for cis fluid analysis, uh, looking at IPMS for another biomarker to help uh, identify high risk lesions, because that's a real problem in pancreas cysts. And kind of throwing that in out of the blue, because we didn't really talk about that. But another potential uh, direction here. So this is my uh, my lab group. We did all this with one PhD and a bunch of undergraduate students, and uh, I think we did pretty well. And so just to summarize uh, what I presented here today, uh, pancreas cancer has a poor prognosis even when treated with the best currently available therapies. Uh, improvement in survival really needs, will only really come after we develop better systemic therapy. And I think surgeons can be a part of that, uh, even though our treatments are, are locally focused. <clears throat> and uh, IL-35 uh, plays a role as an endocrine growth factor in human, human pancreas cancer cell lines and uh, maybe a, a target for um, future therapeutic intervention. So that's, uh, that's all I have, and appreciate your time. Dr. Stewart. So Dr. Dickel, really nice presentation. The, uh, so with respect to your last couple of slides, the, uh, the rationale for, for if I'm clear, the rationale for administering IL-35, you're sort of proposing that it would be a chemosensitizer for the 5-FU gemcitabine because of its growth, because of being a growth factor, or what would be the rationale for that? We haven't gotten there yet. We were simply trying to establish that IL-35 drives the growth of, of pancreas cancer, cell lines anyway. But that's, that's exactly the next step. <clears throat> this part of the normal surveillance that's taking out abnormal cells? So, the so this regulatory T cell subset is probably doesn't flourish until uh, there is an active immune response. Uh, <clears throat> and so uh, we, you know, the other part of this is we haven't even started looking at the, the regulatory T cells in, in this pancreas cancer model. And that may be a whole other side to IL-35, but you certainly could envision how expression of IL-35 not only has direct effects on the pancreas cancer, but may also affect the tumor microenvironment by inducing regulatory T cells and, and shutting down the immune response. Cruz. I enjoyed that very much. Um, I think that it would be worthwhile to just mention our experience uh, from the beginning of this program. And uh, we kept track of all our resections. And the first 100 patients that we had, we didn't have a single long-term cure. And that was really quite, uh, quite significant in, in the history. So going back uh, from the uh, uh, results of these early studies, uh, the uh, concept of neoadjuvant chemotherapy and uh, radiation uh, gradually evolved. And uh, you're right that uh, whereas it has 
promoted a better resection with more patients being considered for a curative resection, the long-term results have not borne out uh, the expected results, which is kind of similar to what happened to breast uh, cancer. Uh, in breast cancer, we have uh, been able to operate on patients with lesser uh, mutilating surgery, but have not extended long-term cure over the uh, historical control. So comes the next uh, stage in the game of uh, trying to cure uh, cancer of the pancreas is the uh, inclusion of the immuno and biological portion of the uh, triad, so to speak, including chemo radiation. And that is uh, producing some um, uh, good results, but it needs a continuing efforts in uh, phase three uh, studies mm -hmm. so that we could compare uh, really the contribution of the immunological portion of it. I enjoyed it. Good. Good. Dr. Abergele, I'm going to talk to Dr. Nichols. I got a couple of questions to ask. You mentioned Andy Wusha, and the last time I talked to him in 2008 in Boston, he still does washing. If the washing is positive, he will not operate. And he did a double run studies on these people that went on to operate on, they all relapse. This is, what, what is the philosophy on this? Um, <laughs> number two, the interleukin. If you remember the interleukin two and melanomas, it wiped out. Everybody was excited. We cured in melanomas. And all of a sudden, back where we belonged. So these two questions always bothers me. Yeah, the answer is actually interrelated because uh, William Traverso, Bill Traverso, who was at uh, uh, Virginia, Virginia Mason, right, in Seattle for a long time, did the same thing with uh, washings. <clears throat> and he wouldn't operate on patients if they had uh, positive peritoneal lavage. Now, that, that group published uh, a protocol, results on a protocol, which was gemcitabine, radiation, 5-FU, and interleukin-2. They had the best survival rates ever published, I think 40% at five years or something like that. However, the uh, one thing that is, is not always discussed about that study is the study's not been replicated. No one else can replicate it. And probably what it comes down to is selection bias by Traverso before the patients actually ever entered the study um, with, the, with the peritoneal washings. <clears throat> Right, so that's another area that, that gets a little bit difficult. De definitely. No more than 5%. This is the best. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yep. So not that's a pretty great. picture. One more. <laughs> <laughs> I noticed that <laughs> in your IPMN, Mm -hmm. You had a little blip there, mm -hmm. and I think that is uh, really enticing mm -hmm. because so. it probably tells you that you should probably treat those patients a little bit more or follow them more carefully because you're really dealing with a pre-malignant entity, so to speak. Right, and, and we don't have a good assay now to assist uh, CA-199 levels are predictive of mucin content, but not malignancy. And there's a VEGF2 is coming to the market sooner or later, which may help. But um, again, we don't have a good way to tell malignant from non-malignant. We can tell mucinous from non-mucinous. Right. Well, the thing is that there's a tendency to under-treat these patients. Mm -hmm. And I say, ouch, no, just keep your eyes open. Or, Things like this. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, thank you very much. Thanks. Our first case uh, for morbidity mortality conference will be presented by Dr. Bunyan.
No, I'm sorry for the data was supposed to be presented last month. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'll be presenting a complication from the Surgical Oncology Service. Um, it's an internal hernia from a previous G-tube placement. Um, so uh, my patient was a 52 years old female who uh, otherwise has no major uh, medical or surgical problems up until 2013 when she was diagnosed with rectal cancer. She underwent a new adjuvant chemo radiation followed by uh, a low anterior resection, a diverting glue polyostomy. She also had a TAHPSO at the same time due to the involvement of the, um, of the female organs with the dysmoplastic reaction of the tumor. She also had a small bowel that was stuck to the uh, area that um, had to be resected and reanastomosed. Um, she had a pre-operative uh, ureteral stents placed given the, um, 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 the dissection down the pelvis. They wanted to protect the ureters. Uh, she did fine. That, that was back in uh, September. She did fine and was discharged uh, uh, after a few days. A month later, she came back with um, a, a small bowel obstruction, and the CAT scan showed a transition point at the loop ileostomy uh, site. Uh, she was taken to the OR at that time, and the loop ileostomy was converted to an endoleostomy and mucous fistula. Um, she, she, her, 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 her uh, postoperative course was benign at that time and was sent home after a few days. Um, in the interim, her, um, she did fairly reasonable, some uh, low appetite, can't eat really good, had some malnutrition. Urethral stents has to be removed and replaced later on due to hydronephrosis. Uh, per, uh, PC and uh, uh, the uh, nephrostomy tubes have been also placed at the, in, that, in that interim these four or five months to follow. Um, next, a few, few months later, in, in May of 2014, she came back with a small bowel obstruction again, and signs and symptoms of malnutrition, low albumin, low prealbumin, she was emaciated. She was treated non-operatively, and um, two or three days later, she was sent home, um, tolerating diet. She comes back a month later with another bout of small bowel obstruction, and at that time, um, the CAT scan showed the transition point down in the pelvis. Um, she did not respond to non-operative management. She was taken to the OR for an X-lap lysophate adhesions. The, um, the ileostomy was taken down at the same time, given that it was already a few months away from the LAR. And what they found was the previous small bowel resection was down stuck in the pelvis, and that was the transition point, so that was redone. Um, given that she was also malnourished, the decision was made to put a G-tube at that time. Um, so a G-tube was placed, and she, um, she d was discharged a week or 10 days after this procedure. A month later, she comes back again. That's actually when I first saw her. I was uh, covering the, as a chief call on one of the weekends. And on, on July of 2014, I met her for the first time in the ED when she was coming with similar presentation of abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And each time she gets admitted, she gets a GDU to gravity. Two days later, she starts passing gas. She has PO challenge and she goes home. And this happened the same time, July, August, and finally in October when she came again, which this time she did not respond. She basically failed all non-operative interventions. And um, um, after a few weeks, we had to take her to the OR. Um, if you look at her examination, if you look at the, even when I first saw her, the G-tube site is... If you look at it from externally, it looks like the first thought is you, th you think it's a J-tube because it's near the umbilicus in terms of a level. But she's so emaciated, she's BMI of 16, it's really hard to say. Her whole abdomen is really small and tiny, like a pediatric um, size. So at, at, you know, eventually we had to take her to the OR, and we um, x slapped her, and I'll show. This is a CAT scan when she came back in October. That was the most massive. It seemed that every time she comes back, she comes with a more obstruction. And you can see here, just kind of an orientation, this is the lower edge of the liver, so we're already down below the liver, almost a little bit above the umbilicus. That's the G-tube side. That's a G-tube, not a J-tube. And these are small bowel distended on each side of the G-tube entrance. This is the descending colon here, and this is the ascending colon here. So that's all small bowel dilated on both sides. It was not called an internal hernia, just air fluid level dilated small bowel with transition points. So um, really it was not even called. And I, 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 I missed that it could be an internal hernia at that time, and, you know, given that I'm, she didn't have a ruined wire or something. So I, I didn't think about it, to be honest. 
Um, she comes in and we took her to the OR and interestingly at this point, you know, she's a very malnourished lady, you know, that's why we're trying to avoid surgeries all these times and until eventually we had to bite the bullet. Her albumin was 1.5, that's probably even better when she first came, was less than 1. Her pre-albumin was, this is the maximum that she went into. And um, we had to extract her. Interestingly, I did not find any adhesions in her belly. The only thing that I found was the G-tube site near the umbilicus and the small intestine on the left side kind of herniated on top and came on the right side of the belly. That's basically what happened, kind of like an um, um, anti-clockwise, uh, uh, counterclockwise um, rotation of the small bowel around the G-tube site. And you can see that all this bowel is distended here. Once you push it back around the G-tube, you can see the distension in the two population of the bowel. The transition point was around the G-tube entrance. Once we reduce that, run the bowel, there's no single adhesion. All the belly is clean, and the pelvis down was clean. There's no rec uh, signs of recurrence of the tumor. Um, now the question was what to do with this G-tube, and she has, you know, take it down, but she has a low albumin, low pre-albumin, she in a leak. So I found this space on top of the belly, just took it down, and the same hole for the G-tube, I just used it to put another G-tube, but this time on top high near the liver, just because I, I was not comfortable, you know, suturing it or stapling it. I don't know if she's going to leak from that or not. Um, she... For the first few days, she did fine. So I'm sorry, and then we closed the fashion, left skin open, and um, she went to the floor. She did fine for a few days. Um, eventually, she had a respiratory decompensation. She had to be transferred to the ICU. Um, she had um, uh, urosepsis and um, uh, went to really fast. Within six days, she had multi-system organ failure. Her liver enzyme shot up. Her T belly was four, eight, I'm sorry, up to eight. Um, septicemia did not clear up. Her lungs, she got a, a ventilation associated pneumonia. Given multi-system multi organ failure, family decided that that was not her wish and she was placed in comfort care and she died on oh, well, almost uh, 10 days after the surgery. Um, so that was the first initial CT scan that I showed uh, on her presentation in October. Um, and that's in the same, from the same presentation. If you go higher up near the mid-liver, kind of you see the, the small bowel descended also there. That's a CT scan that she had in the ICU concerning that, you know, she might be leaking. You can see now the G-tube is at this, you know, on top of the liver kind of a, of a level. It's in place. Um, there was no free air. There was an ensac everywhere in the fluid. There was a situs that was cultured. There didn't grow anything. Um, so basically, I mean, she... It was not a leak, it was basically just um, a multi-system organ failure from a urosepsis that she could not tolerate, probably from her malnutrition. Um, I, I looked at the literature, I didn't see any internal hernia from a G-tube, to be honest, but um, the only when I look at complications of G-tube, they compare PEG tubes to open to laparoscopic G-tubes. And all the literature is in support of the PEG tube, so that's your first choice if you want to put something um, to feed, um, um, unless there's a contraindication. When you come to your surgical options, if you can't do a PEG tube, then an open versus uh, laparoscopic. Multiple studies, I just showed the last, the most recent one that I've uh, seen was a paper from um, from Mount Sinai in, in New York, and basically they compared the laparoscopic versus open in their series retrospectively, and uh, it showed similar over, similar overall morbidity uh, from from overall and G tube related morbidity. The only thing, the major uh, complication, they had few more on the open side than the laparoscopic. Now you could argue that if you have you know. Um, I think it could have been related to the patient disease itself. But other than that, it's basically surgeon's preference and surgeon's uh, experience. There's really not much. If you are good laparoscopic, you can go ahead laparoscopy. Um, if you don't feel comfortable, if there's multiple adhesions, I think you can go with open, whatever is more comfortable and more uh, safe for the patient. Um, I think what, what the, the issue here was, she had, I think the G-tube placement was a good judgment call. She had malnutrition. She had the reason to, to get the G-tube. Um, I think with these people who are malnourished, uh, just like I said, a pediatric size, it's really easy to get lost with, with orientation and you can maybe pull it a few centimeters downwards if you want to put a tube, but these few centimeters means mid of abdomen of those people. And um, she had a, a bowel that had no mesentery weight at all. I mean, you can, it's paper thin mesentery, so it was easily for the small intestine to flip around. And I think it has to be in top of our mind that if such a thing happened, that does not make sense. It could be something else going on inside the belly. And um, the cats can clearly show two dilated loops of bowel on each side of the G-tube. So probably the, the thing that should be placed the G-tube properly up sub xiphoid or near the costal margin rather than down. Questions for Dr. Bunyan? Yes, sir. Dr. Dr. Peterson. I was just going to say that, you know, Tom, I would, it's hard to beat yourself up for missing an intro.
in this case just because they're thin, you don't see, even you won't see the mesenteric swirling. Mm -hmm. But but the one you know telling thing here is that that small bowel is just so dilated. Um, something's wrong. You just can't find it in there. I mean, you know, I think doing bariatric, bariatric surgery has highlighted a lot of the new, the internal hernias. I think a lot of people are much more in tune to seeing it. They watch the swirling, the tornado thing. They're like, oh my gosh, that's what we've got, you know. And so I think it becomes more apparent in even other surgeries because we're thinking that. But I think that was just tough. I don't think you, you know, there's no mesentery. You, you, yeah, you, you don't see a swirl, yeah. so. No, ma'am. The, the, the hysterectomy happened uh, at the same time of the LIR. Gotcha. Yeah. So she didn't get the radiation. She, she got radiation while the female organs were still there. Yeah. And her pathology came back after she responded to the chemo radiation. There was no cancer in all the specimen. How come she didn't get intravenous hyperalimentation? We did, we did give her. That was the best that we could give her up to that, yeah. Sometimes in a cancer patient, you can just never catch up, no matter yeah. how many calories you're given, them, all the calories are going to the tumor. Dr. Stewart. So that's the obvious question. Why, why was it put so low, the G2? Uh, I was not there in the surgery. I don't know why, but I think the, 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 the um, explanation was that was the best side at the judgment at that time, that it could be easy pulled up there due to concerns of the upper abdomen, that there was no space enough there because she's so thin and the costal margins were down there. Uh, on a take back, um, the judgment call was even kind of, you know, I, I showed it to the staff that there is space and like, oh, I don't remember that there was, that was much space there that we can put a tube there. So I think they pulled it out to what they thought was the safest zone or the closest zone. This is a pretty rare complication. You know, for all the gastrostomy tubes, pegs, gastrostomy, whether it's open or laparoscopic, mm -hmm. and all the feeding catheters that we place. Um, sometimes you can see that the small bowel, there's hardly any major root to the mesentery, and I'm always worried about those people with yeah. rotating in valvulus, but I, I don't think uh, in all the years we've been running morbidity mortality conference, I don't think we've heard that particular complication. It may have occurred and just not reported it. What was the incidence again? It was pretty rare. In those oh, I mean, there's no internal harm. I mean, that, that was these are like I was looking complication. They mentioned yeah. everything leak, you know, bowel injury, um, infection sites, but there's really nothing uh, dislodgement of the tube. But there was nothing related to internal hernia. I couldn't find it. Dr. Abrigeli, have you ever seen one in your limited? No, I, I've <laughs> seen, like you said, vul vulvulus, vulvulus malrotation, or something like this, or this adhesion band. Did you, you, I usually tack it. When I, have a, when I have a baby type, I tack, long tack to the abdominal wall just because of this. I want to stay fixed. And that was one of, that, that was one of the, you're talking about a G-tube or a J-tube, I'm sorry. It doesn't matter. Yeah, the same, you, I mean, you, you uh, better was, tack them because. When we reduced the hernia, the question was, you know, discussing that, you know, the side of the stomach, what should we do? I thought about tacking the whole stomach on top, but it was really, whenever i like trying to tack it, the intestine still makes it rounded and comes around. So t clearly the site was not appropriate for the abdomen size, and I don't know why, but I had to pull it up just, it was, I couldn't tack it. Whenever I was trying to tack, it keeps coming back. Yeah. Small momentum, drag it down yeah. between your, uh, your exit, your ostomy, or whatever. I mean, your, whatever you did, yeah. your ostomy, yeah. your ostomy. Keep that momentum as a, as a plane. Yeah. <laughs> All righty. Our next uh, complication will be presented uh, from the VA by Dr. McCarth